let's give it a year, let's do some porn, let's see how it works out. And then in a year's time, I'll go and become a teacher just like I planned. <laughs> You're listening to Fucks Given, the one with a Vex Ashley. Hi, Ree. Hi, Florence. How are you, cutie? I miss you. Oh, I miss you too. I keep sending you voice notes at the end of every single one. I'm like, I missed you so much. (laughs) Especially like going through emotional times. I'm like, I need my Florence here, man. I know. (laughs) But I hate the time zone difference. It sucks balls. I I don't want it anymore. The time zone (laughs) thing is really fucking annoying. Like, because I want to chat to people in my evenings Mm -hmm. and I can't. Yeah. (laughs) I'm so alone in the evening. (laughs) Yeah, you have to be so switched on in the morning. And it's like, that's the most of the voice notes I get from you are just like, yeah, just like, you know, like, you're just like, you're you're not processing yet. And I'm like, they're like fucking telling you all my shit in the evening. Like, oh, fuck's sake. Literally, but but we're going to Washington, D.C. in (gasps) March for the Sexology Summit. Wow. Yes, on the 10th of March sexology summit florence and i are going to be on a panel with some incredible people like our girl scott you're unfamous and also thongra will be on there and her name yeah, her real zoe name Ligon. is thank you zoe ligan yes <laughs> it's gonna be so good um and then after that i'm gonna be in la with you baby yay yeah. and we've been inspired by the interview of this episode to create some nasty stuff yeah, I think we're gonna, Florence and I, we're gonna actually create some porn, porn that we want and stick it on our OnlyFans or try and find out, figure out a way of doing it. So yeah, yeah. stay tuned. I just did want to say that if you're watching this on YouTube, my face does look a little bit fucked right now because my hives have had like a bit of a fuck up and my face is swole, my eyes are all swole. Um, I'm getting an allergy test tomorrow and I wasn't allowed to take any antihistamines, so. Your face is still beautiful, Gore, I promise. I would still sit on it, I swear. (laughs) I would still sit on it, I swear. (laughs) Thank you, Reed. That means a lot to hear. (laughs) So in today's episode, we are talking to Vex Ashley, who is a porn performer, director, producer, editor, extraordinaire. She does everything everything and we dive in deep into like mummy kink daddy stuff um weirdest stuff done on set so yeah you gotta listen it's such it's a doozy of an episode let's get in (laughs) bex you are finally on the podcast (laughs) thank you we finally made it happen (laughs) i know this has been such a long time coming welcome looking glorious as always so excited to have you on before we start because i'm sure there are people out there that i I can't imagine why, but might not know who you are. Shocking. Shocking, I know. <laughs> Please tell uh, our lovely listeners a little bit about yourself. So my name is Vex Ashley. I am a porn performer, a producer, director, and a general all-round uh, naked on the internet girl. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I worked out recently that this is my 10-year anniversary this year of uh, <gasps> wow. getting fucked on film beautiful oh the memories <laughs> 10 going? years that's Ten. actually like congratulations that's Thank fucking you. amazing because it, this is a small business and going for 10 years is incredible yeah yes. it, mm-hmm. it's wild it's i mean it, it it doesn't feel like 10 years somehow and yet it feels like a lifetime at the same time <laughs> so yeah it's interesting to think back at like what's changed, like how far I've come, you know, what's the same, what feels really different, but it is something that I'm pretty proud of. Like, I think it's quite an achievement. Oh my God, yes. If you could tell Baby Vex 10 years ago, what you know now, one thing that you know now, what would you warn her or tell her or advise her with? Really, you have no control over how long anything that you post online is gonna hang around. You've got no control over what someone's gonna do with it. You've got no control over what context someone's gonna put it in or how someone's gonna take it. Um, So something that was really important for me and something I definitely didn't do in the beginning was to really make sure that I was making work and 
posting pictures of myself and shooting things that I was genuinely really proud of, that I felt like Mm -hmm. aligned with the kind of person and the kind of image and the kind of uh, work that I wanted to put out there. Um, Mm -hmm. And I I got sometimes, I'm I'm very specifically talking about a time, uh, a long time ago now, when it was very popular to to be a cam girl who would uh, dress up like a cat, uh, dress up. <laughs> um, and I have, I have some, some slightly, you know, vintage videos of me where, you know, I'm like licking milk out of a bowl. I'm like, and there's nothing shameful in it, but you know, the cat girl era is not really my era currently. Oh my and God, that that's stuff so still, <laughs> it still resurfaces, but it was because I got sucked into that idea of doing what I felt like was going to, uh, make, other people the most happy and it mm-hmm. wasn't necessarily the thing that aligned best with what I wanted to do yeah. um, so I'm I'm always really keen to be like you don't necessarily need to just like jump on every bandwagon you know you don't have to pull a stupid face you don't have to kind of uh you know just tick whatever kind of influencer cool thing is currently going on you can kind of uh try and be a bit Mm self-reflective and think about what feels right for you as a person, not just what everyone else is kind of doing at the time. Yeah, it's just just about being yourself. That's advice. (laughs) I feel like... I mean, I I wish I'd followed it. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like I need to take that advice on board with my OnlyFans stuff because sometimes I'm just like, just throw anything up there. It will be Mm. fine. But you're right. Like, these images, they, they... they turn up on Reddit. They turn up on other platforms. Oh my God, they turn up you, We literally everywhere. have no control. <laughs> it's hard because I think, to be honest, you know, for a lot of people, it's a business. And, you know, if something's popular at the time, doing whatever you think is going to sell, there's absolutely no shame in it. It's just that thing of like accepting that at some point you're going to have to look back at that and be like, oh, weird. That's really not the kind of person <laughs> that I am anymore. And I'm somebody who's always been very... Uh, I've yeah I've been very strictly in control of my image like I find it I find that really difficult to give up control which is probably why you know I've spent the last 10 years just doing everything for myself (laughs) I was just gonna say you're literally a one woman band like I I actually Mm. I'm so in awe of the way that you produce your content because it looks incredible like so high production so amazing and you do everything Thank yeah, you. you are an inspiration to us all. Yeah, going back to that lovely. one, going back to that one video that floats around. I have this one video that I did on webcam ages ago of smoking a cigarette, and it's like I don't mind the ones where it's like my legs are open and I'm fucking <laughs> yeah. myself with a toy, but the ones where I'm smoking a single cigarette, it's like I don't smoke. Those aren't my values. Like it's not me. <laughs> that ain't me, man. And that fucking thing floats around mm. everywhere. It was on Pornhub for a while. That is so, so yeah. random. Yeah, they love yeah. this sm- smoking fetish is a very uh, underrepresented well, fetish but mm. didn't read didn't you used to do like weed porn like back in the yes, day yes yes yeah for some reason smoking the joints on camera totally fine i'm fine with even though i don't <laughs> yeah. smoke weed anymore but this the actual cigarette you know like one of like the fucking marlboro mm. lights like oh I was like, oh god nice. but yeah weed weed and porn and like like sexual stuff was very much intertwined for me because every time i was high i'd wank so mm. like weed became a sexual Ooh, thing yeah. Um, but no, not anymore. I had to give that shit up, mate. Really? It's gone. Yeah, it's gone. It's go. interesting because I've only very recently. I, when I was younger, I was I I basically thought that weed just made me want to throw up. But I realised it was because you know when you're 14 and you're smoking that like horrible, gross bit of resin that oh, your God. you know stoner yeah. boyfriend and his friends has been carrying around <laughs> in his back pocket for the last three days. <laughs> oh, apparently, actually apparently it's gag. actually that. <laughs> Um, and I've kind of recently <laughs> discovered smoking weed and sex for the first time. And it's yes. actually really oh expanded my, my sexual kind of uh, repertoire. I think it's one of those things where I can completely see how people um, develop complicated relationships to it. Because, you know, mm-hmm. it, just one wrong move and all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, I, did I say something weird? But the thing spiral. that it does... Mm. Oh, the spiral, yeah, but... So for me, it's very much, it's a bodily thing, not a social thing. I don't want to have to have a conversation with someone, but I want to feel like I'm in my body and able to connect to sensation. And 
I, it's not something I'm very good at in a in my regular life. Yeah. So weed with sex is great, but weed all day every day not so yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. No. Yeah. You're for shaming sure. over here. I feel like I can't shame people for that in California. They, yeah, that's <laughs> very true. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You're right. It didn't work for mm. me. It fucked me up. Yeah. But it can mm. work for other people for sure. But what? Um, mushrooms, psilocybin, and sex is like the next thing I want to have a go at. What um, yeah. was your your experience with weed and sex? Just very curious. It's basically just that I think that despite the fact that, you know, I would be probably considered a sex professional, I hope so after 10 years. Yeah. I, would, um, I would say so, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I've actually, I've always been very uh, confident at performing sex, but I have found it difficult to really deeply connect with my body and sensation outside of um, performing for somebody else. And hopefully that means that I'm a good porn performer because I am an adept at that. But what it's meant is that I have had to do a lot of work with refocusing myself, like recentering myself, trying really hard to um, find my sort of sense of pleasure internally, like rather than how it's being portrayed to somebody else. So weed is actually um, in lots of ways helped with that because what it seems to do uh, in moderation um, is it kind of helps turn off the the thinking part of your brain and allows you to just kind of exist in the bodily part of it to some capacity and yeah. it has been kind of helpful um, you know it's not something that I do every day and it's definitely not something that I do every time that I fuck but it is it does definitely kind of help with feeling a bit more connected to mm. my body that's really interesting, I think, as well, because you don't really think about that side of being a porn performer and, like, having to po perform sex all the time and doing it on camera because that must, in a way, like, without you even really thinking about it, create a different relationship with sex because you're always yeah, on, right? You're always, like, thinking, oh, what does this look like to other people? Yeah, and I think that's performing is something that lots of people, especially women, are trained to do almost subconsciously by society from a very young age with regards to sex. So the reason why, you know, sometimes sex work can feel like it uh, allows you to harness some of that and some of the way that society sees you in a way that can feel pa more powerful, like you have control over that gaze is because we're all, you know, we're, we're so good at it. Like we've, we have honed our skills with it for years. We make it kind look of how... so real. <laughs> so it's real that true. even we can believe it. And then we're exactly. like, this is what real sex is. And it's like, no, 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 we need to actually oh connect. God, I, don't, yeah. I don't know if you have same issues around like connecting to orgasms and and like like for me clitoral stimulation, I find so hard. It's even with like my favorite toy, it still can take so long to be able to have that i think especially women but not just women i think also mm. men as well have watched porn and they have that performative outlook the amount of times i ask a dude like oh what actually turns you on what do you like with your body and they're like oh i guess i don't know like like they've just got no idea um and i think we're all we're all guilty of that because no one taught us how no one taught us how to enjoy and connect with our bodies and actually feel pleasure we all keep that secret what we do when we masturbate is like oh no i can't show anyone or tell anyone but that's the thing we should be honing in on like what do you do when you masturbate alone yeah and i think that you know matt you're 100 percent right in the you know everyone really i think everyone just wants to do a good job everyone wants yes. to you know they want to so, be great. for a lot of men as well i think they sometimes feel trapped in this idea that they have to be this like alpha male they have to direct the action they have to you know in a in a traditional kind of straight dynamic um that it's their responsibility to kind of do everything and then the receiving partner is is essentially just expected to lie there and act like this is the greatest thing to ever happen to them ever and that does a disservice to both of those people because you know there's there's a gap there where we're learning we're you, you know you're taking in information and you're adjusting what you're doing based on that and I think everybody can probably relate to having sex with somebody where you just feel like they're either going through the motions that they've kind of trained themselves to do or they are just performing um, and you're like 
I can I can see what you're doing. Yeah, I can <laughs> um, see. So how, how do we how do we break the cycle? How do we get out of that when we're in the moment? Um, what's the best advice to connect? I I think that even just getting to the stage where I, identi- I identified that I was doing that sometimes was really important. I think just yeah. giving yourself space to think about whether or not the sex you're having is really satisfying you in a number of different ways. Because you can have incredibly... I perform in sex all the time and I love to do it and I enjoy it greatly. It doesn't mean I'm having bad sex. It doesn't mean the sex is, you know, unsatisfying. But what it, I, I did identify was that it was, you know, just a facet of sex and, and that I needed to really get back to thinking about um, my physical pleasure outside of that performance. Um, yeah. So I just think even naming it and then... Um, you know, taking time with somebody to, it sounds really corny, but like you have to like allow yourself to breathe in that sexual interaction. Like you have to like um, relax your body, like all of your muscles, you know, when you're holding yourself in a position that you're so tense and it feels like you're, you're trying to essentially kind of provide either like you want to look good or you want it to kind of, you know, fulfill what the other person wants to do. Um, and just giving yourself the space to like relax. And I think the most important thing is for me, like actually being able to, uh, ask for something, um, in a way that, that it, you know, doesn't make you feel like you're kind of breaking the action, but like being direct and asking for what you want uh, and practicing that, practicing that again and again, even when it feels a bit scary or it feels like, you know, maybe it's, uh, it makes you feel like you're too demanding or you're maybe kind of ruining what's going on or anything like that. I think being able to advocate for yourself a little bit, uh, and it's a process. It's a process that I'm still not perfect at, at the age of 33, you know? Um, so don't like not, not being too hard on yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's also awesome, like what my therapist said to me once, which was like, your pleasure is your responsibility. Mm-hmm. So it kind of just Mind takes it all blown. into that. It's just like, you, yeah. you're the one that needs to communicate and like figure out what you want with your body before you th- can then go into a partner's situation, really. Mm. Yeah. Like no, also... nobody gives you an orgasm. Like you together exactly. with somebody exactly. yes. build an exactly. orgasm potentially. Yeah. And we've been taught wrong, right? We, we would put people on pedestals and be like, well, they, they need to go and like rub my clit. They, they need to know exactly what they should go and get the sex toy. And it's like, no, we're not, we're not asking for what we want and what we need. Um, I also find asking other people questions kind of gets us into that zone of being open and vulnerable. So if you're asking, you know, like, I really want to know what actually gets you off. Like f- for me, asking to watch someone masturbate or how they wank their cock is like such a vulnerable thing. But I can see where their fingers are and what pressure points they are and and, and what parts of their body they hold. And then that makes me think about what I do exactly. And, you know, it's it's a maze, isn't it? It's very complex but the more you engage in questions like that and activities like that and, and like are willing to be open and open your mind then yeah the easier it does become it, it becomes like breathing and you know we take those walls down but yeah it's it's not easy to do it's not no easy to get there. it's totally not and and I think what's interesting is like just just little stuff like um only through you know uh trial and error do you realize that like um, you know, some guys jerk off like with an upward motion and some yes. guys jerk off with a downward motion, but both of those two guys don't really know that the other kind of wanker exists. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's that, it's that thing. Yeah. It's, it's almost like, you know, uh, did you see that thing before where some people were like, oh, do you wipe standing up or do you wipe sitting down on the toilet? And Wait, it was what? like, what? it was like it genuinely like the, that some, I mean, I'm, I would just like to come out here right now. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm advocating that I am a sit down wiper. Like I'm not Me standing too. up Always. and wiping. Yeah. But, um, somebody, uh, somebody posted this thing being like, ha ha. And people who were couples had no idea that the other person was a stander upper. Wow. <laughs> and they were going like, how do you, how, what, yeah, how, what? how do you get to the, the butt? Like how... <laughs> Isn't it so, clenched? How do you do mm-hmm. the little yeah, scoop? How do people stand? 
stuff and why that's i, I don't know never knew that this happened but are we are we but... thinking just are we just thinking people with vaginas <laughs> here you know like people with no, penises they a... do a little stand up penis dab no no uh, i mean i i think i think i think that's we're maybe talking people, like yeah. Poop, poop, okay yeah. okay what about the front or back thing because that blew my mind when people were like mm. do you wipe front to back or back to front and mm. it's like naturally yeah sure we're supposed to because of the poo in the vagina situation <laughs> wipe front to back but that really confused me because <laughs> i was always wiping like i'm trying to yeah i was always wiping you're like Huh. back to like front but not like but not like over my anus and so no. I, I felt shame for a long time because i was like oh my god i do wipe. i'm one back of those guys but like, but I'm not getting poo all up in my time. vagina. <laughs> no, that's dutty fingers for you. <laughs> dutty fingers and dutty penises that give me thrush. Yeah. And not washing my sex toys. <clears throat> well, yes, that is yep. that is also that is also a good piece of advice actually from a former cam girl. It's like <laughs> I know it's I know it's a bore, but you really want to put those sex toys in a in a about a bath of boiling water yeah. occasionally yes yeah. giving them a rinse is not enough uh, no so I, yeah. I need to like have some wipes by my doxy my doxy just lies on my floor i was thinking about this like every time i put it down it's just it's picking up shit and like i'm putting yeah. that yeah. back on my punani and uh, i <laughs> we got to look yep. after ourselves better, but it's just the lazy mm-hmm. wank situation. You can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I feel like we, we should go back to you and Four Chambers because I'm sure everyone really wants to know, how did you start doing Four Chambers 10 years ago? Like, what was the... Yeah, how did it all work? What was the inspiration behind it? So I was um, at university... I was I was doing art at university and I was also spending a lot of time on a site that you might remember called tumblr.com. Um <laughs> and I, I know. Um I was really interested in the way that on Tumblr it was the first space that I'd seen where people were curating their porn alongside basically everything else in their life on their blog. So you would have people sharing like, you know, memes and personal posts and fashion inspiration and porn they liked, and it would all exist together. And it was kind of curated in this aesthetic way. And I had been doing some kind of uh, low key, like uh, Suicide Girls-esque modeling for a site called God's Girls. And I'd met this amazing community of Uh, other people around the world who were doing sex work but doing sex work kind of on their own terms not necessarily I'd kind of considered that to do porn you had to be the kind of cookie cutter uh, blonde uh, you know augmented body uh, like the 90s traditional porn star um, and I was yeah. a little goth basically and I was like that's not really for me I, 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 I don't think that that kind of gels with me um, but I but through doing this modeling and through spending time on sites like Tumblr I could see people who were really doing sex work on their own terms and keeping their sense of identity and keeping their individuality and I thought that was really interesting and I was interested to see if I could explore the kind of creative and aesthetic potential of sex in through porn but in kind of in the same way that I was doing it at art school where I was interested if sex and porn could be a medium for ideas in the same way that like painting can be a medium for ideas and I essentially just started making these little tests um kind of experiments that were like sexy music videos basically to songs that I liked and just posting them on tumblr and the response that we got was just incredible you know uh it really felt like people were really connecting with it in a way that I wasn't expecting. And it just sort of spurred me on to think that like, wow, there's real potential in this that hasn't really necessarily been explored uh, very much. And it, it kind of, that space online really gave me a lot of room to um, explore sex in a creative way, which was what I was interested in. 
and I thought I was going to leave uni and uh, become a teacher. And I, <laughs> wow, I, I know. <laughs> uh, uh, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to give myself a year. I'd, I'd kind of started camming. I was making way better money camming than I was like working like a minimum wage retail job. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? Let's give it a year. Let's do some porn. Let's see how it works out. And then in a year's time, I'll go and become a teacher just like I planned. <laughs> And well, 10 years later, <laughs> here we are. I mean, you could say you're a teacher in some respects. I've I would taught say people you some are. things, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, so, you know, the dream came true, just it wasn't the cookie cutter teacher <laughs> yeah. that I was used to. I really relate to the idea of what porn was supposed to look like, what we thought porn was supposed to look like, especially being the age that we are, like in our sort of early 30s. And being obsessed with porn and enjoying porn but there literally being only one type of porn out there to watch so genuinely thinking that that was what was sexually attractive and we necessarily weren't so I, I love the fact that you kind of took that and was like no actually no I'm gonna make my own thing and of course it, it pays off it's successful people are desperate to see that kind of content one of the things that has been genuinely the nicest and most amazing thing for me about doing this kind of work is realizing that what is considered to be attractive sexually um, by quote-unquote society uh, is so much more expansive, so much more diverse, so much more weird than we could ever imagine. My favorite thing about the cam site was you could click to the very back pages where, you know, there were one or two people in, in these rooms and it would just be somebody who looked nothing like the kind of person that you would imagine could, you know, do well on these sites. And there would be one person in that room going, oh my God, you're so hot. Like, this is this is the best thing I've ever seen. So it's that thing where you go, Oh, all of that stuff that, you know, we're, we're told actually doesn't even begin to touch the sides of how interesting human sexuality is. And getting to explore that has been such a blessing and really changed my idea of, of you know, what, what being attractive or, or kind of being hot means or is yeah yes yeah well it's what? about feeling yourself right is um we're, we're seeing now like Pornhub have come out and said that there has been an explosion in people trying to find real content so like you know like real amateur and real sex real orgasms all these tag words that have exploded when before we we weren't really clued into the fact that it wasn't real we we wanted so hard to be suspended in the belief that it was real because it's porn it's what turns us on but now i yeah. think people are clocking onto it and they just want real people and i think that's what that's what you give with all your work is that element of authenticity that people are craving so desperately well that's, that's really nice. interesting because it is one of those things where i I definitely don't, when I'm making films, actually really strive for authenticity. Like, you know, my films, if you haven't seen them, are weird. <laughs> they don't <laughs> look like your everyday sex, you know. Often often there's some kind of strange lighting and the setting is kind of relatively fantastical. And I was kind of interested in going for, you know, something that felt um, atmospheric and felt you know, like it captured some of the vibe, but I was, I was definitely kind of going for something that was um, almost like more unrealistic, more kind of fantastical, more like your imagination, your sexual imagination than necessarily your day-to-day -day sex. But one of the things that was really important for me, and I'm glad it feels like that maybe to you, is that, you know, the sex itself can't get trapped in all of that unreality. Like sex for it to feel hot has to feel like, um, to some capacity and an authentic connection or a connection, you know, that you can really get into, that you can really believe. And, you know, the way we shoot sex, we try and keep it very fluid and very organic and we don't script it too much and we don't prescribe to the performers what we kind of expect them to do. We try and let it unfold in a way that feels good for them. Because for me, that's what makes the hottest sex scene. How yes. much time do you actually spend filming the sex um, compared to like the intro and the setup and <laughs> the ending, you know? Yeah, I mean, we, 
we kind of try our hardest. It's as, as basically as, as we've gone on, my standards have got a little bit higher for stuff where <laughs> I used to be of like, course. oh yeah, we can, we can, you know, in and out and in, in, in and out <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> in a couple of hours, that's fine. But now I'm a little bit more like, you know, maybe there's specific shots I want, maybe there's specific kind of, we try and make sure that for me as a porn performer, spending any more than half a day on set, especially if you're having to like to kind of fuck and, you know, keep that energy up, um, more than half a day for me is going to kill the energy. So we try really hard to make it so we'll feed people, they'll arrive, we'll, you know, get get looking like we need to we'll talk through some stuff we'll shoot a little bit and then generally yeah this the sex does shooting the sex shouldn't go on for you know more than a couple of hours and that's not like you know we're not we're not doing like pounding uh for those hours it's like it's more of a kind of gradual build up as soon as people get a bit tired and a little bit hungry and a little bit um burnt out that's where you really lose some of that kind of um intensity and I, I mean I've heard my 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 kind of professional porn performer friends have talked about you know being on set for like 18 hours and stuff oh, like that and I'm just God. like I couldn't be me no well I think that's what's so amazing about your production is that you are a performer and the director and the producer so everything that you do on set is going to be catered to how you know it feels really comfortable when you're on screen and when you're fucking that was really important for me because you know, I think performing sex is such a deeply vulnerable experience for everyone involved. You know, we can't pretend that it is a job like any other. So what is important is to realize that, you know, for me as a as a director, I I feel like it's really important for me to have the experience of what it's like to, to, to do that very vulnerable thing mm. so that I can hopefully, you know, work as hard as I can to make that experience as easy and as, you know, as, as drama free and as, you know, comfortable as possible for the people that I'm asking to do that. If I'm making money off of people fucking on film, I should have fucked on film too. Yeah. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's something that, you know, that, that just makes sense, I think. And hopefully it means that I can be a better director for my performers. It's like they say, if you, if you want to be dominant, you should also be in the submissive space position at least once so you know how it feels all of the best doms that i know started off as submissives or masochists <gasps> oh that's fascinating you know it's not like they're like polar opposites they're like a circle like this so you know at the bottom the extremes you're actually very close to to each other i think next question tell us about and forgive me if i pronounce this wrong the the maman the maman, <laughs> the maman porn. Maman, um, maman, <laughs> maman. <laughs> yeah. So you know, we're. I'm. I'm. Uh, my stressful day today was because I was having a, a an intense editing day on the second part of of this project that we're in the process of kind of bringing to completion, um, which has been uh, basically kind of focused on. Uh, me and my friend Valerie's uh, shared fetish and appreciation and love of uh, being mommy uh, yes. and exploring the sexuality of the mother archetype and why that's so taboo within society, why it still feels so much more taboo than, let's say, you know, calling your partner daddy. Yes. Um, why, yes. Why, maybe why we're into it. Um, and kind of specifically why we're into it as two people who are maybe making the decision that we're not going to be mothers for real in real mm. life. Yes. Oh my God, that's fascinating. So there's all of this like amazing complexity and that kind of, we, we started thinking about it over lockdown um, and we decided that our lockdown project was going to be essentially uh, in, inducing lactation uh, without pregnancy or carrying a child did you actually um, do that you know that I have a massive lactation kick, really right? <laughs> yeah. wait and you didn't know you can do that no I did know that you could do that and it kind of did happen once with my ex I mean what I think is the most amazing thing about it or the most interesting thing about it is literally everyone has the potential to be able to induce lactation regardless of gender um wow 
I, I, I have spent a lot of time on a lot of Reddit forums and there <laughs> are instances of people talking about, you know, a, a guy and his boyfriend um, and he, he loved having his nipples stimulated. So his boyfriend would, they would just sit and watch TV and his boyfriend would just be playing with his nipples. And at some point, Jesus. at some, oh. that's, so, that's so cute. But like my, my vagina is fucking loving this story. Sorry, carry it's on. It's so cute, right? But, and yeah, yeah apparently, apparently it, it basically meant that he started lactating because wow. the, if you stimulate the nipples huh. enough, the, the little, you know, the, the yeah. brain's going, I guess, I guess we need these. Let's, yes. let's go guys. Both Florence and I have had times in our lives where we have lactated, not loads, just tiny little bit. And um, I even talked to my doctor once and she was like, well, if you're stimulating the nipples and I was like, that's exactly what I'm doing. Most of my wank sessions are just nipple related. I have to confess, I am stimulating the nipples. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Sorry, doctor. I shouldn't shouldn't be doing that, but it's happening. Uh So throughout lockdown, have you just been stimulating your nipples constantly? Like how? Kind of, yeah. it was you know I'm not going to go into like loads of detail about it because it kind of comes off maybe as like it is something that you have to think um it's what basically we we used uh, a medication that one of the side effects of the medication is also lactation but what I don't want to do is essentially kind of encourage it as if everyone should just start taking this you know off-label medication and because you know we did a lot of research about how it would interact with other medications we were taking we know we we spoke to a doctor we you know so I I don't want it to come across like I'm giving advice but if you are interested in it there are amazing forums with so much information out there and if you're really serious about it doing your own research about it and reading other people's testimonials and thinking about how it might work for you there are different protocols that you can do. Um, but what was crazy is how quickly it worked, you know? Wow. wow. I, we thought we would be in it for the long haul and it, it really, it's apparently, you know, not, not it, for whatever reason, it, it, happen, it happened really quickly. And it actually really freaked me out the first time because... Really? Yeah, the first time that it happened, I mean, I was masturbating and playing with my nipples and I looked down and it was like some kind of Cronenbergian body horror where I was just not <laughs> expecting it. And I was just like, Ugh! <laughs> even yeah. though I find it so hot, it was yeah. just this idea, of, you know, of something. So that's just not what that body part, you usually see that body part doing. Especially a fluid that you've created, like out, almost like out of thin air. And it's like, we're so used to all the other bodily fluids, but when you, when you, when it's there with your nipples, you're like, I did that. I it was, created it, this. Yeah. It definitely freaked me out. I thought I was pregnant. Yeah. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. yeah. I even, I think I went to my ex being like, so this has happened. I'm going to do a pregnancy test. And we both sat there and was like, this could be the future. <laughs> and then it's I like, mean, what a, mm, what a project. Yeah. That's yeah. incredible. Almost like manipulating your body but in like such a positive exciting way especially I I really appreciate you saying about not planning to have kids in the future and how that might also affect the thought process around this the reason why I think mommy stuff for me especially at this age feels so potent and so it's such an interesting space to play in sexually is because when you get to this age if you are somebody who is able to conceive and carry a child Um, you have to start having conversations with yourself about whether that's something that you want. Unless you're 100% sure, either way, the ambiguous in-between with a clock that feels like it's counting down feels really horrible. Like it feels, there's such a huge amount of pressure. And I think that motherhood is often considered in society to be the pinnacle of womanhood you know it is your the the way you can access goodness in society is by being a mother and fulfilling your you know your feminine your duty, duty as <laughs> and all of this stuff is obviously bullshit but mm-hmm. the problem is is that that it's it's you know not necessarily the easiest to 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 give up or to untangle yourself from and so I think for right. me, there was there was a, a grief there in, in giving up the potential that I might be somebody who would be a mother at some point. And regardless of the fact that that's something that I'm maybe choosing for myself, or even if it's just the way that your life goes, you know, it doesn't even have to be a choice. 
there's an amount of kind of grief there. And I think that grief is a very exciting uh, space to play around in sexually. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> oh, that's, okay, because I'm so here for this. Grief, yeah. please tell me more about yeah, how grieving like, how can I with, yeah, turn yeah, this with breakup, the breakup grief into mm. sex? Yeah, how, how can I turn my breakup into some fucked up sex, please? Yes. <laughs> we sometimes, a, a really interesting way of feeling more in control of something is to erotic it you know I yes. in the same way that you know I've been with people who have eroticized my you know performing porn with other people as almost like as a way to feel like you know as my partner that they're either a part of it or it's something that's you know that's that's hot for them you know that's a way of kind of uh, giving your brain uh, a bit of a break from the kind of complexity of it and going maybe it's maybe it's actually just horny and maybe this is a good thing for me and you know that is a totally valid and hot and interesting way of processing those things and I think sometimes we give sex a lot of flack for you know people say oh you know BDSM has nothing to do with with trauma or you know and, but for me specifically often you know that is a space where you can take all of these complicated things and play with them and turn them into things that feel interesting or good or explore the complexity of them in a kind of space that um, is a space that you are um, in control of in some capacity. I hard relate to that fully, especially with the, you know, like my tickle fetish. It makes sense. It's all about control and changing that into something that's that's I actively want and that's pleasurable and like I have my own control within those parameters especially with yeah BDSM mm. oh I really like I'm gonna delve yeah. deep into the idea of grief and playing around with that because it's it those are two seriously polar opposite things so mm. to mesh them together is very exciting I'm gonna I'm gonna go to my therapist <laughs> I, about it when I was writing my erotic <laughs> stories I wrote a story about having sex with my ex and I think I actually found yes. that quite cathartic in some kind yeah. of way because like wow. when I was writing I was fully imagining like me and my ex fucking I guess at that point I was still kind of grieving from it as well one of the most incredible moving and intense things I've ever seen at a porn film festival was a film um that I think it was called just called birth and it was a film where someone was essentially uh getting fisted by uh, a a a partner while this audio of them discussing how she's barren was playing over the top. <gasps> and oh my God, that's incredible. He, he, it, was, it was so intense and it made, it honestly, you know, it, it was a, incredibly uncomfortable to watch, but in this like absolutely captivating and fascinating way. And afterwards she was speaking about it where she's like, me and this person, you know, we just have a shared... Um, fascination and appreciation of just getting to the darkest heart of the thing so sometimes when you're like I, I'm, I don't I can't speak for you Florence but you know sometimes where you're like fuck I have all of this com complex stuff that I don't know what to do with you know what maybe I'm just going to stare into the heart of it and go I'm going to face it and be like I'm going to imagine having sex with that person that I miss or you know that I still have complicated feelings for or that you know was really important to me at a time but no longer is in my life in the same way it's interesting because I think people use um, like kink and the kink space as therapy sometimes. I know that we heard like a great story from the people of sex because using their trauma and kind of recreating it in role play to help kind of get over these like deep root feelings. Mm. My therapist on Better Help recently was just like, I was talking about my like daddy issues basically and she was just like well why don't you like link up with some of the amazing sex kink communities in LA she was like I'm not saying that kink is therapy like she kept saying I'm mm. not saying that kink is therapy yeah. but like it, go and explore this in a sexual way that's like deeper than you've ever explored this I think I think the thing is is that you know people say oh this isn't therapy this isn't therapy but I think maybe just thinking it's less about what isn't therapy and more going 
How can I, you know, take something from this? How can I just have experiences that are maybe going to enrich my life or make me see things in a different way that can be therapeutic, but are maybe not specifically therapy? And then, you know, you can take those experiences back to therapy. I think just like giving yourself space to explore yourself and not just like, not just kind of doing like, fluffy self-care things and being nice to yourself i was thinking about this like why i enjoy cnc or consensual non-consensual so much and i was thinking about like especially in the form of being pansexual but enjoying that specifically with a masculine man and wondering if that was like tied to feelings of abandonment with my dad and then almost like flip reversing it so much so that some masculine man wants me so bad that it doesn't matter whether or not I say no and stop I don't want this they are like almost so obsessed with me they can't help themselves so it's like the whole polar opposite of dealing with the abandonment issues and then moving that into something so like intense and extreme as someone being like completely obsessed with you so yeah just like being able to like accept it and open your mind to it just it i mean it's just been blowing my mind and it's helping me get through a lot of those issues that i have it's it's one of those things where you know sex isn't this totally separate thing from the rest of our lives and all of those things if they're infusing our communication and our interactions and our relationships in a non-sexual sense, it would be remiss to assume that they weren't also doing that in a sexual sense. So I think the problem is sometimes when people go, oh, well, of course you fantasize about this because you have daddy issues. Yeah, motherfuckers. We all come to this life and sex with a whole bunch of baggage. And I think, you know, why shouldn't why shouldn't we just explore all of that in a way that feels good rather than going oh i can't like that because that would you know mean that uh, oh, of course i would like that because you know yeah, i, like, I oh, have this freud issue. was right i want to fuck my parents oh. <laughs> yeah. it's like but who who doesn't have parental issues who doesn't mm. have family issues you know we're all coming to this with those kind of issues no one can have a perfect upbringing and a perfect you know like role model and parents so it's like it's just about almost leaning into it and accepting it more and it does it changes how you feel about sex it changes how you feel about the shame and the embarrassment and you know it, it can open you up to a whole new world of exciting pleasure and potentially it turns you, you on know, it turns you on you know turns yeah. you on and and you can deal with the trauma at the same yeah. time wow mm. i'm so excited for your new series thank you yeah when when's it coming out do you have like a date you can tell tell the folk so the first part is already out now um and um it's kind of half a traditional porn and half of a kind of um a, a documentary where I, I guess a documentary where we're we're speaking about having conversations about um this fetish and why it's interesting that's out now and then i'm working on the second part of it which goes kind of deeper into some some other aspects of it um and that is i'm i mean i'm hoping uh oh i said it so you know within the next 11 days <laughs> it's okay. gonna be out hopefully and yeah we are premiering it at an event at the amazing bishop's gate institute if i don't i don't know if you know what that is oh i think i've have I got tickets to that? I think maybe I've got tickets to that. <laughs> I mean, maybe I'll see you there. Um, but it's it's an amazing, um, basically like an archive of the history of, um, you know, kink, queer culture, fetish culture, you know, kind of countercultures related to sex and sexuality in the UK in the, an amazing building in, in Bishopsgate in London. And it's just such an incredible space, such an incredible archive. You know, the people that work on there are doing amazing work. So it's, it's premiering at an event um, on Bishopsgate on the 24th of March, but it'll be out digitally before that. I have some very, 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 very exciting news. I wrote a book. <gasps> what? what? Oh, that was like that was my mouth cheering for you. Mm. The book is called "This Book Will Make You Feel Something" because it certainly. I'm, I'm certainly feeling something will. now. <laughs> Florence wrote a book, everybody, and this is us telling you that you're gonna have to pre-order it. It's available to pre-order now, and the book is a 
selection of 25 erotic stories that I wrote myself and some masturbation advice, tips, everything involved with learning to reconnect with your body and have amazing solo sex. You've got the tools with the stuff to turn you on and then also Mm. the stuff to make that really fucking amazing. If you enjoy reading or you've ever been into fan fiction, this is the book for you. I feel like I've been through watching Florence go through this process and she has literally poured her heart and soul and pussy juice into (laughs) this book. What are some of your favorite stories from the book, Florence? Oh my God, my favorite one has to be the cowboy and the bandit story. And I did some vampire and monster stories, but then there's also some like BDSM sex parties and then some just like plain simple romantic stories basically everything for everyone the cover is beautiful it's something you need to have on your coffee table thank you the pre-order link will be in the description underneath the podcast or it is in the bio on my instagram at florence bar can't wait to have it in my hands a physical copy thank you in advance for pre-ordering the book and yeah i love you all We actually have some questions from the Curious Fuckers as well. The first question is, do you have any tips on how and where to consume ethical porn? Interesting. Yes, You're like I do. my website. But... <laughs> <laughs> so I have a complicated relationship with the idea of ethical porn. And I think that stems from the fact that ethics and ethical as a label is something that's very subjective person to person. Really, for me, what matters is what does the company do on the ground? Are they making the kind of content that you think is good? Are the performers who are working for them loving working for them? And are they treated well? Are they paid fairly? Are we ever, is everyone kind of having a professional time? If you're worried maybe that, you know, somebody might have been asked to do something that they don't want to do, the one, one thing you can do is, you know, buy, buy content from a performer directly because they will be there. They, they've been the person who has kind of, um, you know, brought the shoot to fruition they're they're going to be more in control of what's happened I do think that that's not necessarily a blanket rule because we're seeing a lot of people shooting a lot of content for OnlyFans and that kind of thing which um you know the complexity of that is that sometimes it's just two people in a hotel room without anyone else on set without there being any kind of checks what you've got to do is just do a little bit of extra work to ask some questions do a little bit of research you know think for yourself about what you're interested in seeing and what's important to you about the content that you're consuming just being a little bit critical and a little bit thoughtful could that was that's giving me a lot of food food for thought because it's a question that comes up all the time what we've decided to do with four chambers is to just try and be transparent about how much people are getting paid what a day on our set looks like what we're asking of, of people you know how it all goes down and we just kind of put that information out there and like hopefully let people make up their own minds rather than being because I think for a lot of people they don't actually really know how porn is made um and what actually goes on so it's hard for them to even imagine what an ethical kind of set looks like for them so the safest bet is to find someone you like you fancy um, find them on Twitter and see if they got any links, right? That's the. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that definitely, I definitely think like the most amazing thing about OnlyFans has, you know, in the, in the 10 years that I have been getting naked online is that it's really put a lot of the control of these things back into the hands of performers. So people are shooting stuff that they often are, are really into. And I think your fans are going to be really into it if you're really into it. Yeah, Florence, when I come to you at LA, can we film some porn, please? (laughs) Yeah, why not? (laughs) Okay, next question. Somebody asks, what's the kinkiest thing you filmed? The kinkiest thing I have filmed would probably be a film that doesn't exist on my site anymore because it's too dangerous, too kinky for my payment processes. (laughs) <laughs> um, we shot a scene um, that I, I'd i seen, uh, the two performers were a couple at the time, they um, are both really into BDSM, and they had made these amazing photographs of um, a, a scene that they would do where um, one, one of them would like make these tiny incisions along the person's back, just tiny little cuts, 
Um, and have you ever seen, Florence, you will know you've been in LA. It's like a very LA thing, this, this process of cupping. Yes. Basically what you do is you make, they, they would make these tiny incisions and put the hot cup over the incision, which would draw the blood out into Ooh. the cup. Um, it looks like so much blood, but it really isn't. And the incisions are very small, but it is obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's a process that requires like a lot of trust between the two people. And it's, you know, it, it was a very uh, intimate thing to shoot. Um, yeah. And essentially then they, they would like take the cups off and like rub the blood around and, and fuck in the blood. Wow. Wow. Which does oh sound God. very intense. Yeah. It was, genu- it was genuinely one of the more like romantic shoots of, uh, because it, it required such trust between these two people, you know? Blood is huge. There's so many different like ways to make blood work within sexual play. It's like connecting with your sense of like bodily vulnerability. It's, and it just, I mean, I watched um, Queen of the Damned as, you know, an impressionable oh, teenager yes. and watching her drink the blood of somebody's neck and like put, come out of that pool of like, mm. ugh. I'm I mean, like, there's something about vampires, right? Vampires so. are really hot. Yeah, this is and it's thing. like. It, and, True blood, when, when they had the scenes where the blood's like still around them, they lick it all up and it's like, mm. that's hot. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I don't know about you, but when you're having period sex and you have like some handprints over your body and they're all like bloody, that is hot. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I, I love just, that. I'm trying Florence, but my OCD will not allow. <laughs> <laughs> like, I cannot mm. enjoy. I'm like, mm. <laughs> okay, just Duh, like, let me no. do some... You know, compulsive tendencies for a second there, hold up. <laughs> but it is hot, it is hot. I'm, my goal for this year is to have like really messy period sex and not like freak out about it. That would be great. That would be, that's the dream. I wish you um, well in your, in your quest. That was a pretty kinky thing. So thank yeah, you. yeah, it, it really was. And, and, and yeah, and then, if, and then the payment processes were like, yeah, no. <laughs> it's interesting that that's not allowed because I feel like there are similar things online. It is specifically about whether or not um, the content is broadcast in a way that is intending to cause sexual arousal. So wow, you could no. make a documentary about <laughs> it, you know, quite happily, but right. because what I'm making is porn, that's why it's not allowed because we consider sex to be like this special level of dirty and depraved right. that right, is right, different right, right. to just yeah. watching someone do it on film in a different context. It's time for your fuck off story, Bex. <laughs> uh, this is one that I have used and reused a number of times, but you know what? It still stands. The weirdest thing that I have ever done on a porn shoot is me and a performer called Stoya and a performer called Mickey. Um, we were making a adaption of a very depraved and strange book called The Story of the Eye. We were in a dilapidated kind of old cottage on the river, um, uh, on the river in Hackney somewhere. It was (laughs) freezing. There was the only thing in this cottage, it was like essentially, I I guess they were hiring out for film sets and stuff, but there was kind of like a crumbly old sofa. There was one of those old Victorian beds that squeaks, like Mm -hmm. almost like metallic. In this book, uh, they are obsessed with kind of globular objects, so testicles, eggs, eyes. Um, and uh, one of the things that I really wanted to do in this shoot was I wanted to put an egg in my pussy. Um, and I'd gone to Waitrose and I'd bought... Uh, Waitrose. The, have you ever seen... seen In Waitrose, they sell these like blue eggs. I'm also vegan, so, yes. you know. Oh, I was, wow. I was like, okay, you know, for the for the art, I will I will buy the egg, and you know, I was like, I'm gonna fall on the sword. This is me being like, I might be the director, but I'm the performer, so I'm gonna be the one to put the egg in my pussy. You know, that that seems fair. Um, so I pop it in there, and you know what? It goes in suspiciously easily. It just goes, and the the idea is that you're like. God, I hope the shell, the shell stays intact because that is a yeast infection <laughs> waiting to happen if, if anything happens. Yeah. So it goes in and the idea is it, I was going to put it in and then I was going to lay it out of myself. Wow. The problem is, apparently it's very easy to put the egg in. Oh. It is a lot less easy to take the egg out. No. Apparently laying an egg, chickens make it look easy. It's a lot harder <laughs> than you would think. So... 
I'm I'm sat crouched, you know, full squat uh, on yeah. the floor of this like crumbly old cottage with uh, Mickey and exactly. Stoya just absolutely laughing their head off of me with me like straining trying to lay this egg. And then at some point uh, Mickey realizes that it's Mother's Day. So I'm trying to lay <laughs> an egg uh, with my pussy <laughs> on Mother's Day. Um, and it, yeah, it's essentially, eventually I have to kind of like, have you ever taken a moon cup out? Yeah, you yeah. know sometimes the moon cup is not the easiest extraction process in no, the entire world. No, like the vacuum situation. The vacuum, yeah, <laughs> it felt like that. Where I had to really go digging, digging for this. I, uh, and you know, thankfully, I didn't put it in my butt. You know, so it can't get lost. Oh fuck! We managed to get it out, and we got the shot, and the shot looks great. Uh, but it's one of those things where um, whenever people go, oh, what's what's a weird thing you've done for porn? I'm like, probably the laying the egg. <laughs> a real chicken egg and a motherfucking vegan yeah that's up there Aww. oh that's that up, up there on the chart that's all i the want i chart. want that validation <laughs> <laughs> well done thank you this was fucking amazing thank you so much vex for coming on the podcast you've been inspiring and exciting and yeah i feel like a lot of people out there that feel some kind of way about the content they want to create or the sex they want to have um, I think you will alleviate a lot of stresses. So thank you so much for chatting, chatting to us so candidly. Um, please, please tell our curious fuckers like where they can find you. Give, give all the clout and everything that you're doing instead of eggs. <laughs> so I am Vex Tape on basically everything. Um, Vex Tape like sex tape, and my project is called Four Chambers or a Four Chambered Heart. Um, you can find it at afourchamberedheart.com and it is Four Chambers on Instagram and Four Chambered on Twitter because somebody rudely stole the Four Chambers handle mm, there. Rude. The best way to keep in touch with me is to sign up for a, you know, you don't have to pay for it, but you just sign up for a Four Chambers account and I'll send you an email every now and again because who knows how long we're all going to last in this social media hellscape. Curious fuckers, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it far and wide. And remember to subscribe, follow, leave a rating and a review if you haven't already. And of course, word of mouth is the best. So if you can share it on any platform, you can as well as tag all of us. And our personal accounts are Reed, Amber X and Florence Bark. And of course, we are Come Curious and tag tag everyone in because it's nice and friendly and fun. We can repost it. <laughs> Anyway, curious fuckers, we will see you next Thursday. And thank you so much. See you Bex. next Thursday. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.